Hello everyone and welcome to the Ben's Chem Videos Sunday Night Livestream. Tonight, we are going to embark on a new journey as we introduce a brand new topic. A topic that has never been discussed on this channel before. I'm talking, of course, about aqueous ionic equilibrium. So without further ado, I present to you Aqueous Ionic Equilibrium, Volume 1. So when we talk about aqueous ionic equilibrium, we can get a rough idea of what this topic entails by just examining those three words, aqueous, ionic, and equilibrium. Aqueous, of course, means water-based. We're talking about aqueous solutions, chemical reactions uh, occurring within an aqueous water-based environment. Ionic, well, that means we have ions, right, which are positively or negatively charged atoms or groups of atoms. So we're dealing with ions. And equilibrium, remember, that's the condition of a reversible reaction such that the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. So just with defining those three terms, we can get a rough idea of what aqueous ionic equilibrium is. And before I go any further, I want to just provide to you the following disclaimer, which is that if you want to have a good understanding of aqueous ionic equilibrium, it is essential, it is absolutely necessary that you understand acids and bases. And as much as I would love you to stay on this live stream, stay on this video and watch it all the way through to the end, because that's what the YouTube algorithm tends to reward nowadays. What I really don't want to happen is for you to get frustrated because I'm talking about jargon, terminology, things that are over your head because you don't have a rock solid understanding of acids and bases. So if you are not super confident in your understanding of acids and bases, Fear not, because I do have a playlist called Acids and Bases live streams that will discuss everything you need to know about acids and bases to bring you up to speed. And of course, there's a link to that playlist down there in the description. So let us continue now that we've gotten that disclaimer out of the way. So I'm going to move myself out of the way here. So the topic of aqueous ionic equilibrium uh, can be broadly divided into three sort of categories. The first one, which we'll talk about tonight, is buffers, buffer solutions. Uh, the second one is titrations. And then the final one uh, we're going to end up with is solubility equilibria. Buffers, titrations, solubility equilibria. There's a little bit of an overlap between these uh, categories, between these sub-chapters, if you will. Uh, but I think this is sort of a good way to think about this topic overall. So we're going to begin our discussion by talking about buffers. So what is a buffer? So simply put, a buffer is a solution that can, contains significant amounts of both a weak acid and its conjugate base. So remember, a weak acid, that's an acid that does not ionize completely in water. It ionizes partially to the point where it reaches equilibrium, right? And the conjugate base, that just means the chemical species that results once you have removed a proton, an H plus ion, from a weak acid. Remember, conjugate acid base pair, those are two substances that are related by the loss or the gain of a proton, of an H plus, right? And so that's what a buffer solution is. It's a solution that contains significant amounts of a weak acid and its conjugate base. And the main function of a buffer is shown uh, down here in blue, which is that buffers resist changes in pH. So we're gonna talk about how exactly buffer solutions resist changes in pH. So a good example of a buffer, so there's a lot of examples of buffers, uh, countless types of buffers, uh, but one good example of a buffer is a mixture of carbonic acid and bicarbonate ion that exists within our blood as human beings. The pH of human blood typically is maintained at a, at a pH value between 7.36 and 7.42. And that's a rather narrow range. And what are the factors that are responsible for the blood being able to achieve such a narrow range in pH, despite uh, whether you add some acid or you add some base to blood? Well, the way that works is the buffer solution regulates the pH. And the way it does it is the Carbonic acid in that buffer neutralizes any base that is added to, to the blood, and the conjugate base of carbonic acid, the bicarbonate ion, neutralizes any acid that is added to human blood. So this is a generally how buffers sort of work, right? So 
Let's imagine uh, that we want to prepare a buffer solution in a laboratory. So how would we do that? So this is an example of the preparation of a buffer consisting of acetic acid and acetate ion. So it's very, very simple. All you do is you take some acetic acid, which is your weak acid. You take some acetate ion. Now in this formula, it's shown as sodium acetate because uh, the acetate ion is an anion. It needs to have a cation paired up with it um, in order to not shock you when you touch it, basically. Uh, so the sodium ion, you can basically ignore it. It's very uh, chemically inert. It doesn't really contribute to the acid base uh, properties of the buffer solution. So really the, the important part of that conjugate base there is the acetate ion. And so you mix those two together and voila, you have a buffer solution composed of acetic acid and the acetate ion. So if you have such a buffer solution, so let's say you have that acetic acid, acetate ion buffer solution, what would happen if you were to add some hydrochloric acid, some HCl to that buffer solution? Well, if you were to add HCl to a uh, acetic acid, acetate ion buffer, then that added HCl is going to be neutralized by the base of the buffer, which in this case is sodium acetate or the acetate ion, and it'll react, the HCl will be neutralized by that acetate ion according to this reaction here where you have HCl reacting with sodium acetate uh, to produce acetic acid and sodium chloride. So basically what the buffer does is it takes that strong acid that you add to it and it sort of converts it to uh, a weak acid. And as long as you don't add too much H HCl, uh, then it will be neutralized and the resulting change in pH as a result of adding that acid to the buffer uh, will be minimal. Uh, on the contrary, let's say you wanted to add a base to a buffer, what would happen to that solution? Well, if you add a base, a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide, NaOH, to the buffer solution, then that sodium hydroxide is going to be neutralized by the acetic acid, according to this equation down here, where you have sodium hydroxide reacting with the acetic acid to produce water and sodium acetate. So basically, the acetic acid sort of converts that strong base into a weak base, water, right? So that is sort of how it works. And as long as you don't add too much NaOH, then the buffer will remain intact and the resulting change in pH will be uh, minimal. So that's basically, generally speaking, what happens when you add an acid or a base to a buffer. But of course, later on in this live stream series, we're going to get more quantitative, get more detailed, uh, try to figure out, well, how much does the pH change when you add a strong acid to a buffer? How much does the pH change when you add a uh, strong base to a buffer? And so on and so forth. So let's say we have a uh, buffer solution, and I'm going to put some numbers on it. Let's say we uh, prepared that buffer solution with acetic acid and sodium acetate. And let's say we prepare that solutions, solution such that the concentration of acetic acid and the concentration of sodium acetate are both 0.5 molar. So we have a solution that is 0.5 molar in acetic acid and 0.5 molar in sodium acetate. And let's say we wanted to calculate the pH of that solution. Well, in the previous live stream series, we're talking about acids and bases, we learned how to calculate the pH of a weak acid solution or the pH of a weak base solution, uh, but we never looked at both. We never looked at the pH of a solution with both uh, significant amounts of both the weak acid and the conjugate base. And so how would we go about doing that? Well, there's one of two methods. Uh, one of them is significantly easier than the other, and I'll discuss both methods for calculating the pH of a buffer solution um, in just a moment. So one way that, well, okay, let me uh, backpedal a little bit. So we must keep something in mind, which is that if you write this equation up here, which describes the ionization of acetic acid to produce hydronium ion and acetate ion, right? That's just the equation that describes what happens when you put uh, acetic acid in water, right? The ionization of that acetic acid is going to be inhibited. It's going to be suppressed relative to a solution that does not initially have any conjugate base, any acetate ion in this case in it. And so 
Um, to demonstrate this, I just want to refer you back to a concept that we learned in chemical equilibrium, which is called the shot liaise principle, which basically says that any chemical reaction at equilibrium uh, is going to respond in a way that minimizes disturbances to that equilibrium and return to equ equilibrium once again. So that basically means that by having some uh, acetate ion in there already, right, that's going to push this equilibrium more to the left. And this acetic acid over here isn't going to react as much to produce hydronium ion as if it would if there were no acetate ion at all in there from the beginning. Okay. And this phenomenon, right, in which the the ionization of the acid is inhibited relative to a solution that doesn't initially contain any conjugate base, this phenomenon is called the common ion effect. And that is so named because both acetic acid and the acetate ion both share a common ion, which is, of course, the acetate ion, right? So this is the common ion effect. So that's something that is good to sort of keep in mind uh, going forward before we take a more quantitative view uh, of this process. So let's say, again, we wanted to calculate the pH of a buffer solution. So one way that we could do it would be a way that is already quite familiar to us, or at least it should be, if you have an understanding of acids and bases and of chemical equilibrium, then you've already seen uh, a solution to this type of problem sort of worked out in this way, where you write your chemical equation for the ionization of your acid. You construct an ice table, initial change equilibrium, right? You populate that ice table with your initial concentrations of everything in here, which they are uh, sort of given by the problem, so to speak, we start out with 0.5 molar of each, and then you can reason that the concentration of your acid is going to decrease in a, by an amount that you can call X, and uh, consequently the concentrations of hydronium ion and of your con uh, conjugate base are going to increase by that same value X, and that leads you to these expressions down here, which describe the concentrations of the reactants and products at equilibrium in terms of that variable x. And then what you can do is you can uh, insert those values into the expression for the acid dissociation constant, or Ka, associated with that weak acid. And that helps you to build a quadratic equation. You solve the quadratic equation. Maybe you would incorporate the x is small approximation within that solution. If all of this sounds foreign to you, then Sorry to say this, but you don't understand acids and bases or chemical equilibrium well enough to stick around. So again, I don't want you to get frustrated. So if you need to brush up on that material, please click the, uh, the link below in the description for the acids and bases live streams playlist. Uh, it'll avoid a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration. So again, so you write your equation, you construct your ice table, you get your equilibrium concentrations of everything expressed in terms of X, you use that to build a quadratic equation, and then you solve that equation um, to arrive at the concentration of hydronium ion, and then subsequently you take the uh, negative logarithm of it to get pH. So that's a very long-winded, <clears throat> kind of an inconvenient solution to this type of problem, but it is nonetheless a way to solve this. It is a way to calculate the pH of a buffer solution. But actually, there exists a second way that's much, much easier by which you can calculate the pH of a buffer solution, and it involves the use of an equation called the henderson hasselbalch equation, right? henderson hasselbalch equation. And this equation is very useful because all you have to do is just plug in your concentrations for weak acid and conjugate base into the equation and you can solve for pH very, very, very quickly. And so what I'd like to do is take you to the whiteboard where we can derive the henderson hasselbalch equation from information that we already know, or at least we should know, uh, about acid-base equilibria. So here we are at the whiteboard. So I'm gonna start with just writing a general chemical equation for the ionization of a weak acid in the presence of water. So what would that look like? Well, for the formula for the generic weak acid, I'll just call that HA, which of course is aqueous, and it's going to react with water, H2O, uh, which is a liquid, and we're going to use the 
half-headed equilibrium arrows to separate the reactants and products because this is a weak acid, right? It ionizes partially, not completely. And the products are going to be the hydronium ion, that's H3O plus aqueous. And then the other product is going to be the conjugate base of that weak acid, which we can call A minus. Now this equation, again, this is something that should be very, very uh, familiar to us at this point, right? Now we know that AA, right, that's the equilibrium constant that describes this reaction, that the acid dissociation constant, we know that that is going to be equal to the concentrations of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. So that's going to be concentration of H3O plus times the concentration of A minus. And that whole thing is going to be divided by, whoa, need to do a better job at my horizontal fraction bars there. Again, I screwed it up. Well, what's going on with this pen? Okay. Uh, divided by the concentration of H a right so we arrive at this uh, equation here now what if and i'm going to take this and sort of uh lasso it in to sort of center it a little bit more right there so what if we wanted to solve for the hydronium ion so that's the first step that on our way to deriving this henderson hasselbalch equation trust me it'll all make sense when we're done so what if we wanted to solve for that well uh one thing we could do is uh, we could multiply both sides of this equation by the concentration of HA divided by the concentration of A minus, right? Multiplying both sides of the equation by concentration of HA divided by the concentration of A minus. And again, we're trying to get this hydronium ion H3O plus all by itself. And so what would happen? Well, uh, A minus would cancel, uh, HA would cancel over here, right? And we end up getting uh, the following relationship. I'm just going to uh, erase this stuff as we're done with it. It's all canceled out, right? So I'm going to erase that. And I'm going to take this, move it down there. And I'm just going to take this AA over here, uh, move it. Whoops. Excuse me for a second. Just trying to figure this out. <laughs> over there and uh, let's see I'll take my equal sign and move it right there so we end up with the following uh, equation where we have concentration of hydronium ion is equal to Ka times the uh, concentration of the weak acid HA divided by the concentration of the conjugate base A minus right so this is uh, the next step in this derivation process right so now I'm going to do something uh, to further manipulate this equation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the negative logarithm, and it'll start to make sense why I take the negative logarithm. I'm going to take the negative logarithm of both sides of this equation, right? So I take the negative logarithm of concentration of H3O+, and I take the negative logarithm of this entire expression here, Ka times concentration of HA divided by concentration of A minus. So what does that look like? Well, we know that negative log of hydronium ion expression looks very familiar. Negative log of H3O plus, what exactly does that describe? Well, that is the expression for pH, right? So this entire left side of the equation uh, reduces down to uh, simply pH. So we now know that pH is equal to the negative log of this whole mess right here. And we can use the properties of logarithms, which is uh, something that you probably learned in your algebra class when you're taking mathematics. We can use the, uh, the properties of logarithms to uh, clean this part of the equation up and make it uh, make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to uh, take all this stuff here uh, and move it over here uh, so that I can uh, give myself some room. So this term over here, this minus log of Ka uh, times concentration of HA over A minus, how can we rewrite that? Well, we know from the properties of logarithms is that if you have the logarithm of a product, I'll just call it logarithm of A times B, right? 
that is going to be equal to the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b. And if you don't believe me, you can actually try this out with two different numbers. And um, just to confirm, you can just type that into your calculator, you know, like log of uh, six is equal to log of two plus log of three and see what those numbers are. And you can confirm your for yourself that this is a true statement, that the log of a product is equal to the sum of the logarithms of the factors uh, within that product, right? So what that means is that the pH is going to be equal to, drag the equal sign over here to get a little bit more room, that's going to be the minus log of Ka, right? Minus log of Ka plus excuse me, not plus, minus the log of HA over A minus. So how can I clean this up? Let's see if I can drag this. It doesn't look like I can resize it. I'll just kind of move it uh, down here. So EH is going to be minus log of KA um, minus, because this negative carries through, the logarithm of concentration of HA divided by concentration of A minus, right? And so how does this help us derive a useful equation? Uh, basically, um, here's how. Now, minus log of Ka, that is an expression that describes something that we are already familiar with if we understand acids and bases. That is what we call pKa, right? The P of anything is just minus log of that thing, right? So pKa is minus log of Ka, right? So this whole thing, this minus log of Ka, we can substitute that for pKa, right? So we have this equation here, pH equals pKa minus the logarithm of concentration of the weak acid divided by concentration of the conjugate base of the weak acid. And finally, <clears throat> we can use the properties of logarithms again to arrive at uh, another equation that's the final henderson hasselbalch equation. So the other property of logarithms that I'm going to describe um, is that if you have the uh, logarithm of a quotient, so I'll just say A divided by B, if you have the logarithm of A divided by B, that's the same as the negative logarithm of the inverse, B divided by A. So a log of a quotient is equal to the negative log of the reciprocal of that quotient. And again, if you don't believe me, you can try this yourself with your calculator um, and confirm that this is true. It's just properties of logarithms. I don't have a really good way of teaching um, the proofs in mathematics because I'm not really a math teacher. I'm a chemistry teacher, but you know, it's still important that we understand at least this much math um, in order to uh, in order to understand these relationships, right? And so basically, what that means is that we can uh, rewrite this equation one more time to be the pH is equal to the pKa. Instead of minus the log of this, we can have plus the log of the uh, reciprocal of that. So instead of uh, concentration of uh, HA in the numerator, we can have uh, A minus, and down here it is uh, HA, right? And so this right here, this right here, this equation, pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the concentration of base divided by the concentration of the acid, this is the henderson hasselbalch equation. This is the HHEQ, right? The henderson hasselbalch equation uh, that we just arrived, uh, again, it reads as the following. pH is equal to pKa plus the log of concentration of base divided by concentration of the acid. And so now that we know this equation and we understand it because we derived it from information that we already had before in our knowledge of acids and bases, if we are given the concentrations of the weak acid and the conjugate base in a buffer solution, we can simply plug those values into the Henderson Hasselbalch equation uh, to solve for the value for pH. Now, one thing I must, um, one little caveat that I must announce about this equation is that this equation is only valid when the x is small approximation is valid. And so, what does that mean? That just means that it's valid when you have um, fairly concentrated solutions. 
if you have a very, very dilute solution, then this equation may not be valid. But in most applications, uh, it will be. So what we're going to do uh, for the next couple of minutes is we are going to look at a couple of examples in which the, we calculate the pH of a buffer solution using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just paste a problem right here in the whiteboard. Uh, I'm going to erase all this stuff that we don't need, uh, and I'm going to leave behind the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation because that is going to be what we end up uh, using. So let me see if I can get rid of this uh, little green poorly drawn oval around my equation here just to clean it up a little bit. pH equals pKa plus log of the concentration of base over the concentration of the acid. So this thing up here, how do I delete that? Let's see, I think I can just click on it, delete it. So, all right, so we have our equation here. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to move it up just a little bit, and I'm going to paste a problem in here. So bear with me while I do this. By the way, if you are finding this stream valuable and you would like to reciprocate, I would be very happy about that. <laughs> well, whether that means uh, throwing a thumbs up on this video, sharing it with people who might be interested, or supporting the stream via Super Chat or some other way. Um, any support that you can provide in return or the value that you are getting from the stream would be very welcome. Thank you in advance to all those who are considering it. So uh, bear with me for a second. I'm just trying to find the problem uh, that I can paste in here. So I got the problem. I'm just going to paste it into the whiteboard here. There it is. Make it nice and big. Okay, I think probably good. Okay, so this problem tells us to find the pH of a solution in which the concentration of chlorous acid, HClO2, is uh, 0 0.846 molar, and then the concentration of sodium chloride is 0 0.199 molar. And it also says that the Ka of chlorous acid is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2. So as you can imagine, we are going to be using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to solve this problem. Got a message in the chat from Goose. It says, hey, just wanted to say I really love your videos. Helped me a lot through chemistry last year. Amen, brother. Thank you very much for your kind words and for stopping by the stream. Really, really appreciate it. So we're going to be using this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation here. So basically, we need to uh, kind of just plug the values that we're given into this equation, right? So pH equals pKa plus the logarithm of the concentration of base divided by the concentration of the acid, right? So the concentration of the conjugate base in this case, that's the uh, ClO2 minus, which is part of this NaClO2, uh, that is 0 0.199 molar. So I'll just go ahead and write that in. That's 0 0.199 uh, molar, right? I guess I don't need these brackets. Let me... Uh, clean this up. So it's 0 0.199 molar, right? Concentration of the weak acid in this case, that's chlorous acid, that's 0 0.846 molar. So it's 0 0.846 molar, right? And then pKa, well, we don't have pKa, but we do have the Ka. And so getting pKa from Ka is very, very straightforward. All we have to do is take the minus log of the Ka, and that gives us the pKa, right? So where we see this pKa term, I'm just going to substitute that uh, for uh, the actual expression for pKa. So that's minus log of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2, right? So this is it. So all we have to do to get the pH is to take the minus log of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2, and then add to that the log of 0 0.199 over 0 0.846. So if anybody would like to calculate this along with me, um, just to check to see if I've messed up, because it's entirely possible I am human after all, um, feel free to follow along. I've got my calculator right here. I haven't solved this problem ahead of time. I'm doing it literally live on air for the first time right now. So give me just a second here while I type this in. So we have the minus log of, let's see, 1.2 times 10 to the negative 2 plus the logarithm of 
point one nine nine divided by point eight four six. So, uh, how many significant figures would that have? I think it would have three decimal places. Um, I'm not going to concern myself with that right now. I'm not going to worry about sig figs. I just really want to be concerned about the application of this Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So if I end up with the wrong number of sig figs, uh, please don't crucify me for it. So this value that I got when I plugged all this into my calculator was 1.292. So that is the value of pH. So literally all that we did was we put the concentrations of the base and concentration of the acid into this equation. And then we just, you know, had to recognize that pKa is the minus log of Ka um, and put that in there. And we were able to apply this equation uh, to solve this problem. So we're going to do one more problem and then that's going to wrap us up for the evening. So for those of you who have been watching, thank you very much for your attention. I wholeheartedly appreciate it. And yeah, if you, uh, if you have any feedback to give, um, I would be happy to hear it. So who says, are sig figs really that important? Uh, yes, they are. They are important. You know, if you're going to be working in a, a laboratory, um, sig figs are very, very, very important. It's important to understand the reliability of the measurements that you're taking and how they, the reliability of those measurements carry through when you perform calculations. Uh, so in that sense, it's important, especially if you're talking about things like food or medication or or things like you have to be very, very um, quantitatively accurate and precise with. Uh, yeah, sig figs are very, very important, but they're not really important necessarily for this video because this video, I'm just trying to talk about buffers. So, but yeah, I, they, they definitely are important. You're never going to hear me say that they're not important. So, all right, we're going to, I'm going to paste another problem in here. Uh, bear with me while I do that. And then that'll finish the discussion for the night. So, here is the problem. Okay, there we are. So the problem says to find the pH of a solution in which the concentration of hydrofluoric acid is 0 0.1, excuse me, 0 0.410 molar and concentration of lithium fluoride is 0 0.410 molar. So they're identical. The concentrations of hydrofluoric acid and lithium fluoride are identical. And so let's see what effect this has. Um, on the pH of this buffer solution, right? So, of course, we're going to use that henderson hasselbalch equation, right? pH is equal to pKa plus the log of concentration of base divided by concentration of acid, right? So pKa, how do we get pKa? Well, that's simply going to be uh, the negative log of the Ka, so the Ka, which is given by the problem, is 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4. And then that's going to be added to the logarithm of 0 0.410. You do that again. 0 0.410 over 0 0.410. So 0 0.410 over 0 0.410, what is that? Well, I can probably get you to agree with me that that is equal to one. So really we're talking about the log of one, right? And what's the log of one? Remember what a logarithm is, is the number that 10 has to be raised to, to get what you're taking the logarithm of. So the question is, what number do we have to raise? What power do we have to raise 10 to, to get the number one? Well, that's zero. Goose just correctly typed his response to that question in the chat. Yeah, it's zero. So really, this whole term, this log of concentration of base over concentration of acid, completely cancels out and equates to zero when the concentrations of the weak acid and the conjugate base are equivalent. And so what are we left with? Well, we're left with an elevated understanding of the henderson hasselbalch equation, which is that when your concentration of your weak acid, right, when your concentration of your weak acid, so let me do that again, concentration of weak acid is equal to the concentration of your conjugate base, then pH is equal to pKa. So it's a very, very uh, useful eye-opening uh, result that we've just discovered. So 
Uh, at this point, all we're left with is just to punch in negative log of 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4 into our calculator. So allow me to do that. By the way, if anybody else wants to do that, I ain't going to stop you. In fact, I would encourage it. So we have a negative logarithm of 6.3 times 10 to the minus 4. And the value that I got, so I think I typed that into my calculator wrong. 0.3 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, the value that I got was 3.20. So 3.20, that is the pKa of hydrofluoric acid. And that is what happens when the concentrations of your weak acid and your conjugate base within your buffer are equivalent, the pH equal to the pKa under those conditions. All right, everybody. So I'm going to head back to this screen right here. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm really, really excited to be talking about aqueous ionic equilibrium. Really, I'm just excited to be no longer talking about acids and bases. I did it for nine straight weeks, and I'm happy to be moving on to another topic. I hope you are as ecstatic about this as I am. I hope you have had a wonderful weekend, and I hope you are all geared up to have an amazing, wonderful, productive week at school or work or wherever you happen to be going this coming week. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you in the next live stream. Sundays, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Take care.